Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for um, our webinar on um, generative AI and how investors can navigate the regulatory hurdles. My name is Kim Moore. I'm a deputy editor for Global Corporate Venturing, and we are producing this um, webinar in collaboration with Fenwick. Our panelists today are Dylan Gochi. He is the senior associate at IBM Ventures. We also have Lara Moritzen. She is the senior director and head of legal for Salesforce Ventures. Those are the two um, investors on the panel. Then we have Christopher Sestito. He is the CEO and founder of Hidden Layer. Hidden Layer is a, a company that has developed a platform to protect AI and machine learning models from cyber attacks. Then from uh, Fenwick and West, we have Stuart Meyer and Vijay Lala. They are both um, partners at the law firm. So before we begin, I'm just going to uh, sort of uh, frame the discussion. Um, so we are looking at um, regulatory hurdles to AI investing. Um, many countries across the world are coming up with regulations for generative AI technology. And investors in the technology, as well as AI companies, need to be um, aware of these regulations and prepare for them. So there are lots of concerns that generative AI could infringe on people's privacy and even undermine human rights. And so countries are passing regulations to protect people from bias and discrimination and protect businesses from copyright. Um, just on the, the copyright issue, um, there is a very high profile lawsuit going on right now. So the New York Times has filed a lawsuit against Microsoft and OpenAI alleging um, that OpenAI, that's the um, developer of ChatGBT, um, has unlawfully used its articles to create AI-generated content. Um, so the outcome of this uh, lawsuit could then define how AI developers um, can use copyrighted material for their models. Um, and also there's the issue of deep fake images and videos. Um, generative AI has um, shown that it can uh, produce deep fake images. There was a very recent case where um, pornographic AI generated images of um, the US singer Taylor Swift were spread on social media. So obviously deep fake uh, images infringe on people's privacy and also um, can spread disinformation. But there are some regulations um, coming into place. In the US, there's an executive order, which is a very broad reaching policy framework for regulating AI, and that the details of that are still being sketched out. Um, in Europe, there's the e EU AI Act, um, which sort of sets out rules for the development of technology and how it's used. And this uh, regulation still needs to be approved. So in the meantime, the, the value, value of generative AI deals um, continues to soar. So in 2020, the value of venture-backed AI, generative AI deals was uh, three point, almost three billion. Um, and in 2023, it uh, grew to 18.3 billion. So a very sharp increase there. Um, just before I start the discussion, I just wanted to, um, let the listeners know that you can submit questions at any time during the webinar. There's a, um, a sort of Q&A button on the uh, Zoom interface that you can use to submit questions and we'll try and get to them as soon as we can. So um, first of all, I thought of um, asking Vijay if you um, could comment on what are the likely regulations that investors in generative AI should be aware of. Sure, Th thanks, Kim, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Looking forward to the discussion with the investors as well. Um, to give a quick lay of the land uh, overview, and then I'll let Stuart jump in on a couple specifics. Um, you can you just mention some of the major um, regulatory frameworks that are coming down the pike? I'll speak for like 30 seconds about each and then a little bit of an overlay on what I think is sort of headed towards us as well. Um, the EU AI Act is probably the primary one that we're seeing our serial acquirers 
and investors talk about and think about, not only for the operations of their business, but on an investment or acquisition standpoint as well. And the reason for that is it's the most developed framework that's going to have real revenue consequences probably the soonest, um, depending on the level of enforcement. Um, similar to GDPR, it's going to be a model for both uh, other international regimes, but also in the U.S. state laws that sort of focus similar to privacy on um, AI tools. And we're seeing those laws come into place now with respect to automated decision tools, privacy, bias, and other areas. Um, also, the EU AI Act is interesting because it, it buckets the various models, whether you're a foundational model, deployer, um, operational model, or distributor of AI into different risk categories. And I think both on the investment and company standpoint, that's going to be an interesting way to think about risk mitigation, risk allocation. Where do you stand? For example, if you're a foundational model, you need to really think about dual use capabilities. You need to think about sort of other risks that you mentioned, they're not regulatory, but IP risks, um, as well as other risks. So you talked about deep fakes. Certainly regulators are looking at those issues as well. Um, um, so th those are some of the key things on the EU AI Act that, that are going to be important. Um, and you also mentioned the White House executive order, which is about 112 pages, some of it which is aspirational, um, but a lot of it is coming into effect quite quickly. We just saw the Commerce Department issue regulations on infrastructure as a service providers, and the definition of that sweeps in content providers, proxy networks, and others that companies may be investing in and or um, operationalizing and, and need to consider rules and regulations that may come into place sooner than later um, in the U.S. as well. I'm interested to hear more from the investors on how they think about those regulatory hurdles and some of the costs that companies are going to have to incur to, to meet those hurdles as well. And finally, from a U.S. perspective, the Federal Trade Commission is looking at many aspects of this. We've seen recent investigations into investments and mergers. Um, we've also seen more scrutiny around commercial deals and context of investment cloud computing being something that's focused on um, both with respect to AI and separately by the FTC, as well as international regimes from a competition standpoint. Um, so th those are some other areas. And then finally, the FTC has been really banging the drum on the marketing side of AI. If you're talking about trustworthy AI or responsible AI, is that actually something that you can prove in the market? Um, the White House executive order talks about labeling synthetic content as AI created content. So those are other interesting areas that I think we've seen a lot of regulatory blog posts and conversation around. And I think 2024 is going to be, uh, you're going to see more enforcement in those various areas as these sort of regulations become in effect um, and models and, and investments get deployed. So, so that's kind of a, a broader um, framework of what we're kind of looking at. And I'll sort of pass it over to Stuart to talk about a couple specifics within that that I think he's been focused on and hopefully we can get then into a really interesting conversation about some of this. Thanks so much, Vijay. And yeah, I, I think you're you're definitely right that things are starting to gel in 2024. Uh, we're, I, I think uh, companies and investors are starting to get a sense of where the regulation is likely to end up, but there's still a lot of movement. So you can't, you can't aim too specifically. I'll just give you a couple of examples of that. Part of the executive order that uh, was mentioned involves the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, putting together some very serious sort of guidelines and frameworks and now regulation. They were super proud that they were a non-regulatory body before, but now they're sort of becoming a regulatory one. And they had a request for information that was out for uh, a month or two that just the period just closed on Friday of last week. They received 202 comments and I've, I've started started sort of blasting my way through all of them. And, and it's very interesting. You've got large companies with 70-page uh, sort of very detailed discussions. You've got individuals with two-paragraph discussions, but very, very valuable uh, to get a sense of where the stakeholders are coming from. So that's going to impact how they come out with what they finally do. In Europe, you know, it, it's interesting. There's often a lot of 11th hour movement. And I think a lot of people are saying, yeah, that the EU AI Act is pretty much done, but you can't rule out the possibility that something's going to happen to disrupt things a little bit. Uh, interestingly to me is that just yesterday in the UK, the uh, Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology presented to Parliament 
her report on um, a one year, almost a one year effort that was done to try to figure out where the UK should go uh, with its regulation. And it pretty much adopted the innovation forward, innovation first approach that's been used in letting the regulators in the UK um, have, have tools to, to provide incentives. And in addition, um, she said that uh, it's not the right time for legislation in the UK yet. So very different than what the EU is doing, um, saying that things have to settle down a bit more before we go beyond just the regulators using the tools they currently have available and starting to use legislation. So I think all of that says to us, this is a year where we where we can aim rather broadly at what we wanna do, uh, but expect the details to certainly uh, keep shifting. So I wanted to bring um, the um, investors on the panel into the discussion here. I'm, Dylan, if I could start with you, what are you looking for when investing in generative AI technologies? Uh, yeah, and so I'm happy to take it and um, maybe answer that uh, in, in two different lights. The first being just from a pure invest investor perspective and, and what exactly we're you know, our framework is for looking at these companies and then maybe tying in the, the regulatory discussions that we're having here. And I think that they tie into, into each other. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the, the investment perspective. Um, and I think generally IBM Ventures, we've, we've narrowed down our, our framework to three major bullet points. Um, you know, the, the first being some kind of initial technical differentiation. Uh, and what we mean by that is we're looking for technology that goes beyond, you know, what a standard LLM is capable of. Um, and, and then second, we're looking for maybe some industry related barriers to entry. Uh, so in this case, you know, it's something where an LLM would shine, um, but the application requires some kind of deep understanding of a, a, a niche industry or workflow. Uh, and then lastly, um, you know, I think what we've really realized over, over the, you know, year plus since ChatGPT came out, uh, is we have to over-index on, on the founding team. Uh, and I think that, you know, when we uh, find the right team, you know, when we over-index there, uh, you know, that, that, that helps us find the folks that are going to be able to achieve some sort of technical differentiation uh, and also uh, be able to maneuver those industry barriers to entry. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, that's our, our general framework. And then Diving a deep, a bit deeper down into the how we think about um, investing in these companies, uh, you know, and in uh, an environment where regulations are so dynamic uh, and changing, um, you know, I think that's where we go back to that last point that I mentioned around, you know, kind of uh, you know, tripling down uh, on on making sure that we are investing in the right in the right founders, uh, you know, and I think that when when you look at, you know, um, uh, you know. When, when you try to look for what pieces do these founding teams need to have in order to mitigate potential uh, regulatory risks, uh, you know, I think what we try to do is understand how the team has maneuvered their organizations, um, you know, in, in the past through these different regulatory risks. And we try to gain confidence around, you know, what is their background and depth of knowledge in this particular space? And that helps us, you know, uh, kind of underwrite, you know, how prepared we think they are to maneuver the challenges in the future. I wonder if I could bring in um, a hidden layer here, and I, I should mention that IBM Ventures is a is an investor in in hidden layer. Christopher, I was wondering if you could just um, speak to how you um, look, how you incorporate kind of this regulatory risk into the development of your technology and if you could maybe also talk about how you use generative ai in, in your own um, technology yeah absolutely thank you kim and uh, uh you know i think that uh, we get a unique uh, lens uh, when we look at this problem because we're, we're both uh developing uh, uh um you know ai driven solutions generative and otherwise within the organization um, but we're also uh, a vendor uh, that is going to be uh, closely related to um, you know, proving that you are uh, you know, leveraging trustworthy AI as, as we secure these systems, and that will most certainly be part of uh, the regulation uh, packaging that we're talking about here. So, um, you know, in, in terms of our own development, I, I think, um, you know, we're doing a lot of reflecting on other recent te technological shifts and regulation that's kind of come alongside that when you think about things like 
um, you know, regulation that ended up being imposed upon things like endpoints networks. Uh, and then most recently, um, you know, the, the large shift in data moving to the cloud, um, you know, ultimately there, there are certainly sort of a broad scope of, of regulation that gets a little bit more and more, um, you know, specific and targeted to things like industries and then ultimately uh, to even specific technical functions. Um, but, but ultimately, um, you know, it ends up at, at a reasonable place, even though, even if it's a little bit earlier on now. And so I think we need, we are, we're sort of acting as though we're presuming that, um, you know, we, we expect regulation to really uh, look very similar to other technological assets. And, and, you know, I think that should be the goal of regulators today is to hold uh, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence technology to the same standards that we do hold, um, you know, the, uh, the other technological assets, no more, no less. Obviously there are different considerations there with the black box technology of certain types of artificial intelligence and, and some additional sort of um, specificity there that'll be required. But uh, I think if we build and develop within the context of uh, the same expectations that we have, and, and in the past when we were working on more traditional um, types of solutions, then I think we're going to be in a pretty good shape, even if we have to make some minor changes here and there as as uh, regulations come out. Now, now, from the perspective of a vendor that's going to be helping our customers ultimately secure artificial intelligence uh, within the context of regulation to come, uh, you know, we start to think about what that means for more heavily regulated industries where they tend to be, um, you know, uh, held accountable, where they tend to be uh, or to need to plan against for things. And then to that, we look to, as, as Vijay said, we look to things like, um, you know, what we've seen in, in other examples of uh, whether it's GDPR or whether it's other sort of controls uh, to, to help keep uh, companies accountable. And we try and uh, you know, predict what that's going to mean. So in the artificial intelligence side, specifically for us as security vendor, we look to things like what that's going to mean for data integrity, what that's going to mean for uh, things like chain of custody, for model provenance, uh, these types of things. And we can expect that they're going to need to be called out. And, um, and you know, we, we do have pretty broad frameworks today, but they are starting to show some patterns. We see things like Google Safe AI framework, Data, Databricks is releasing a Safe AI framework. We see Microsoft had just released one as well. And when we start to see commonalities across these frameworks, we can have a pretty good understanding of what that's going to do in terms of where, uh, you know, law will ultimately be uh, applied. So we, you know, we try and take the clues that we have uh, in front of us and, and go from there. But then, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, as an operator uh, inside of an organization building uh, artificial intelligence solutions, um, you know, I don't believe we're really handcuffed in, in, uh, in a way where we cannot innovate, but we need to make sure that uh, that regulation does not fall uh, too far on that side of the fence. Now, if I could just bring you in. Um... How do you look at investing in generative AI technologies at, at Salesforce Ventures? Yeah, um, I think just focusing in on the regulatory aspects here, um, I think when we're looking at generative AI companies, we're looking for them to be successful in all the ways that we're looking for all of our other companies that we invest in. Um, but given the kind of regulatory and moving legal landscape here, I think something unique that we're looking for, or maybe just heightened, is really um, the approach and focus of the team long term of staying aware and nimble. Um, uniquely for generative AI, we have seen a rise of this technology from um, sort of outside mainstream to very, very uh, mainstream focus with a ton of um, like individual attention on this. So it, at Salesforce Ventures, we in, invest in enterprise staff. So there's a lot of what we're doing that's much more in the enterprise. And this is very much in the consumer hands. And there's a lot of consumer awareness around that. Um, and I think we've seen regulators move incredibly quickly, um, not necessarily to having regulations in hand, but the discussion has gone from one to 100 really quickly for this round of technological development. I'm um, just looking back to our recent blockchain, crypto, Web3 sort of development. You can see how long it took before we got to this point of regulation. Um, similarly, with data, I think that's such a, an important element, and data regulation is, is going to play a huge part of, um, as we're moving forward with AI and generative AI. Um, but that took a really long time uh, before there were sort of concrete directions and there were frameworks um, and there were conversations across industries. Um, so I think something we're looking for now is ability to move uh, really quickly uh, and to start day one with a seriousness towards the impact of what this technology is. Um, you know, Salesforce has an office of ethical use of technology and was one of the, the first company, first large tech companies to come out and really talk about and spotlight the 
need for front-end attention on impact of technologies. And that's something that we look for in, you know, founding teams, executive teams of companies that we're investing in, particularly in this space that we're all just starting to see where it'll take us. But I think we have really high aspirations of what its impact could be. When you're doing uh, due diligence on um, an AI investment, what's your what's your approach to um, to doing that? You know, do you um, are there any kind of red flags when you're looking at investments? Like, how do you what's your approach to that? Yeah, I think um, what would be sort of unique about this area is that. Um, prior to ab about a year ago, um, I certainly wasn't walking around talking about generative AI. There uh, were large groups at Salesforce who have been working on this for a very long time. Um, and there are individuals who have been building up to this point for a long time. But the conversation more broadly across the industry wasn't as focused. And so I think all everybody... A year ago, it felt like if you knew just a little bit and had done some research, you were miles ahead of most people. And I think that learning curve has moved incredibly quickly. Um, so to the point of, I think Stuart was saying earlier that 2024 is where things are gelling. I think that um, diligence at this point means coming in and knowing enough about these technologies, even from a legal perspective. Um, certainly, our, you know, our investors are expected to dive in and really be able to um, uh, be fluent in that and dive deeply. But from a legal perspective, coming in and understanding the technology is enough to know where the risks are falling, where things are moving, staying on top of everything else. Um, I think BJ was pulling across like five different areas where there's like lawsuits that are moving right now. There's regulators, there's, you know, different jurisdictions, all of which are going to claim stakes. So, um, being really, really nimble and knowing kind of who your experts are. Um, we have the benefit, um, you know, at, at Salesforce of having some great experts around us and leaning in when we need kind of additional technical verification of like validation of technologies here um, and sometimes pulling in um, operators from our team. But of course, do that for or from the like, you know, broader Salesforce team outside of Salesforce Ventures. Um, and we do that incredibly carefully because normally operating sort of within the rounds of Salesforce Ventures is one thing, but when you start bringing in um, kind of support from your corporate, which can really be your superpower to, to double down the flow of information and exactly what conversations are being had, just have to be very conscientious of that and making sure that companies understand who they're talking to, um, who is coming into the conversation from the, the corporate side understands um, and everybody is very clear from like an IT painting or from an antitrust or from all the different layers there um, before those conversations are had, but they can be really, really helpful to, to dive sort of deeper in, or if it's not just supporting, if it's not directly supporting, it's sort of helping the um, investment team and us as a legal team get really smart and leaning on, you know, corporate um, individuals who are living like day in and day out of, you know, our IT team is dealing with the shifts in IT as, as you know, Salesforce develops these technologies themselves. And so being able to rely on them when um, cutting edge shifts happen or when decisions come out or something like that is incredibly valuable. Yeah, yeah I was just going to add in here. I, I think, you know, everything that Laura just mentioned, um, you know, is really reminiscent of, you know, um, how we think about it. But I would just add, um, yeah, I, I think that a lot of our due diligence framework has actually remained the same. But there are certain areas in regards to, you know, AI, generative AI, um, it, in which, uh, you know, the, the scrutiny is now heightened, right? And so I can give a couple of examples um, the, the first, you know, being just the, the you know, who is using this, uh, who is creating this technology. Um, you know, if we look at the uh, you know, different uh, capabilities uh, that are being explored with these technologies, there are nation states that are viewing this as a powerful tool, uh, you know, to uh, advance whatever various agendas they want to advance, right? And we have to be you know, super careful to make sure that we're not investing in companies that are empowering 
uh, certain nations to uh, to advance certain agendas, um, you know, and and you know beforehand that was always a focus that was always within our framework. But I think that you know the attention uh, that this technology uh, is getting, uh, it just in terms of it being a potential tool in you know the geopolitical scheme, uh, I, I think that that has now heightened the scrutiny, you know, and then we can look at other areas as well, um, data. Privacy, um, you know, you know, there's so many regulatory regimes. GDPR, you know, California's, uh, you know, and the U.S. is also, you know, pretty strict uh, about how, when, who is using this data. So I think, you know, uh, it's not something that's necessarily new within our framework to understand, you know, uh, what's going on. But I, I think that the the scrutiny there is again heightened. We want to make sure that. Whoever's using this data, you know, uh, whoever's gathering this data, that they're using it, gathering it in ways that are ethical, um, in ways that we think, you know, even as the landscape evolves, uh, you know, uh, we won't have uh, a big uh, risk down the road. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to add a little bit um, of legal layer over on top of that, Sam, if that makes sense. But, um, you know, I, I think that there's obviously an inherent amount of risk investing. Um, and operating companies like this, right? And that everyone knows that, and you're going to continue to sort of push models and 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 technology is going to far advance regulation, no matter how fast the regulators are going on some level. Um, I think at the what we're seeing at the early stages of investment are a little bit more fact gathering um, than typical around sort of some of the areas that Dylan just mentioned, right? I mean, you know, you've seen earlier privacy diligence in rounds of investments, you're now seeing earlier AI questions being asked. Um, whether you're an AI company or not, for example, if even if you're not an AI company or a deployer, you you actually may use it to code your, you know, your developers may use use AI to develop code. So do you really actually own the core IP that you're developing is a key question for investors to be asking. Um, is there any confidential information going into those uh, models, whether you're using them or, or developing them. And then we've had investors recently call us and say, should we not be investing in foundational models at this point um, or platforms that are getting a lot of data that may be copyrighted? And, you know, while I'm not going to comment on some of the more recent lawsuits on that, because we represent a number of those parties, I will say, you know, that the jury's out or rather the judge is out on what, what is going to dictate some of those answers in the U.S. At, 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 at the time. But at the same time, judges are very wary of completely stopping um, technology development, right? And so you're going to have some sort of balanced approach there that comes out of some of those cases. Now, there are some issues with training data to the extent that you're really taking that training data and regurgitating that, you know, and, and sort of not thinking about how you're developing the model with respect to the inputs that are coming in. Um, but at the same time, if the purpose of the model is really transformative and it's for other purposes, I think that you're going to continue to see um, investment into the space, both um, at the model layer, but also I think 2024 is going to be a little bit more about the application layer as well. And so, um, you know, diligence from our effects of an early, early stage is more about fact gathering. And as companies get into later stages, that's where you start to think about similar to privacy. Are you really starting to comply with the regulations that are coming? And the way we think about that is look at the you know models that are the most strict and then build towards those models, right? So if, for example, in privacy, if California is the strictest model, and Stuart, happy to have you jump in on this, but sort of build towards sort of compliance on a step-by-step -step basis, right? As lawyers who represent disruptive companies as well, you know, we're not telling clients to spend all of their initial cash on compliance. We're giving them kind of a roadmap to think about how they get compliant over the long term. Um, and they are smart with their investors as well. And I'll pause there and sort of let let everyone jump in on that. Well, I'll just I'll just briefly mention that um, there are a number of things that people can look to, whether it's privacy or other aspects of trustworthy AI that people can look to. Uh, uh, the IEEE standard that came out in 2021 uh, has a number of, of good approaches that, that can be used. Uh, obviously, the um, uh, we, we talked about the, the NIST activities um, and the framework that they put out uh, also well over a year ago are good. Uh, the 
um, ISO standard that just came out in December uh, is amazing as well. The good news about it is you don't have to become a super duper expert in all of these things because whichever one you choose, it will put you in the right direction. And you may have to do some adjustments as things evolve, but showing that you're complying with, with any of these things is important. You know, um, from company perspective, last year was all about getting something out there into the world, right? It was all about, I, I know we can't put out proof of concept, but maybe minimum viable product and, and you know, let's just get it out there because we can't be last week. That won't work. And and now I, I think there's a moment of repose where people are saying, how do we do this in a manner that's that's not going to be looked at poorly by potential investors? And I know this speaks to all of what Hidden Layer Salesforce uh, Ventures and IBM Ventures are all interested in. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and bounce it back to others. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe Dylan, you could uh, speak to this, you know, the, the regulations are in real flux, right? We don't exactly know what's going to what's going to happen. So how do you um, go forward with investments? Or are you pausing investments? Like, how do you, um, yeah, approach AI investing when things really aren't um, set in stone at all? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Not to put all the pressure in the world on Tito, um, but 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 again, you know, I, I think this is really where we we triple down on on the, the founders, uh, you know, the the leadership team that we're investing in, um, you know, I uh, just to maybe be a little bit more illustrative, uh, when we were first engaging with the hidden layer team and just understanding kind of what they were doing, and they were pioneers in the space, um, you know, before ChatGPT blew up, you know, uh, the the AI world. Uh, you know, they, they were building this, they recognized the problem. Um, and, you know, they, they've they been uh, experts in this area for, for some time now. Uh, and some of our earliest discussions were, you know, around uh, frameworks, uh, like, you know, the, the work that they had done with, uh, with MITRE, right? Um, some of our earliest discussions were around, you know, what are um, the potential regulatory risks? You know, how, how do we, you know, as an industry, make sure that we get this right? Uh, and I think that, you know, when we sat back and thought about, you know, kind of uh, our investment framework, you know, those discussions gave us a lot of comfort because we felt really comfortable investing in a team that was thinking about this early on, um, you know, had made, you know, not just talked about it, but, you know, made actionable progress, of, you know, or, around trying to advance the industry and how the industry was thinking about it as well um, as real thought leaders. Uh, and so, you know, it, it may be a little cliche, you know, in, in venture, you know, to to say it, but it really just goes back to the founding team. Um, you know, and there, there's a lot of other implications that we look at through diligence, but I think that's the most important piece, uh, you know, so yeah, not to put not to put so much pressure on you, Tito. But... <laughs> I, I appreciate the kind words, Dylan, and I think just to help shed some light for for those in terms of how we were looking at the problem is is really um, you know, when we, and, and again, we are a cybersecurity uh, uh, piece here, which I'll, I'll speak towards that lens, but it, but I imagine many of the uh, sort of, you know, thoughts I'm having will have other infrastructural uh, applica or, uh, you know, uh, relevance with with regard to, AI, to artificial intelligence and other forms. But, you know, we, we think about uh, artificial intelligence in terms of how vulnerable it is. And, and, and in truth, it's, a, it's an incredibly vulnerable technology. It's vulnerable at a code level. It's vulnerable at inference time when you're interacting with it. It's vulnerable over networks and and it's vulnerable at the generative side. I mean, we 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 see we actively see threat actors taking advantage of of uh, you know the attempt of manipulating generative AI, AI to write vulnerable code and um and so it's uh what what's unique about this technological advancement is is just how incredibly quickly we're seeing it hit production uh, because obviously it represents an enormous uh, value to a lot of organizations today. Um, you know, we've certainly seen new technologies be vulnerable in the past, but we've, I don't think we've ever seen it get to the level of, uh, of, of production and in general adoption that we're seeing today. And so, you know, as Dylan mentioned, we thought quite heavily about that, both in terms of what that means from a regulatory side and, and what organizations will be required to do, but then also uh, from the sake of, you know, re really just organically thinking about, uh, you know, what, what does this mean for protecting organizations? What does this mean for protecting data? Um, and then, you know, as long as we kept it, you know, uh, our, our focus on true value and, and, and protecting what's important to organizations and ultimately, uh, you know, whether it be governments or, or, or society in general, um, you know, we, we stayed uh, relatively within the bounds of what we believe will be focused on by regulators. If I could just keep pulling on this thread, I think um, I, sort of like with any type of investing, really the, the lens with which you're uh, using is 
reflective of exactly where the stage of the company is, exactly what industry the company is pointed towards, and um, really what the ultimate outcomes that you're looking for are. So when you're asking the question to us of what are we looking for um, in our diligence findings and, and what's most important to us, I think keeping that framework top of mind. So, um, so many of the companies that are um, attacking new areas right now are, are brand new since we're just in this absolute rush of new technology and what those layers are. So when you're in a really early stage investing environment, it has to be so much about the founding team, like Dylan said, and really focused on the product um, and just getting technology that really works to answer the question that you have in front of you. Um, but as that life cycle starts developing, I think we'll see, um, and even the companies right now that have been around for a number of years and are more established, you start asking yourself as you're doing an investment framework, like where's the, um, where's the exit going to be? And where, like, where is this company going over time? And so I think then it shifts to, or is this company setting themselves up to be a company that could be acquired by a large public, or are they going to go public themselves? When you start using that framework, it's a lot of uh, a corollary for regulatory, like we've seen around margins in the last few years. If you can't be a late stage private company that's looking to be acquired by a public company and never look at your own margins ever, because it's going to have such a negative impact. Um, if you Want to be if you want to be setting yourself up to be acquired by a sophisticated large public company, you're going to have to have taken all the steps that you can to mitigate regulatory risk or legal risk in order to be absorbed, um, you know, into a large company in a really fast and successful manner. Um, if you've just been running totally crazy and never looked at these things, then that acquisition opportunity really might not come. And if it does, it's going to it's going to do so much rebuilding and reorienting um, that will really slow progress in that. Um, and so I think like really targeting to the different stage of company and expectation levels. I think also something Chris said that we've been thinking a lot about is this next phase of next year, like what trends are top of mind and the focus into different industries is definitely something that, um, you know, Salesforce corporate is working off, like hugely building out in all these different kind of industry solutions. But um, I think in the investment um, realm, it's also so much opportunity there to get specialized. And that's something that's going to have, you know, 10 different layers of what different industry you're talking about really specifically. I think health comes to mind for so many of us when we're talking about this, but the generative AI low on top of data, on top of health, on top of the, all the other regulatory that already sits there, I think it's going to be a fascinating um sort of exercise of what that looks like uh, versus in areas that are way less regulated, um, sort of like the marketing solutions or something like that. I know Vijay mentioned the, the truth and advertising kind of elements there, but I think really scoping into much more precision about where we're talking to is really important when you're thinking through like what diligence framework is, um, is uh, most useful there. Hey, Kim, I, I'd like to add another layer on to what everybody just said, which is we've just had a very good sort of discussion about what the regulators are concerned about, what the investors are concerned about. From the company's perspective, um, I think it's really important to think as well about what customers are concerned about now. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Cisco just put out its latest survey results. Uh, every once in a while, they do surveys of companies for various cybersecurity, data privacy things. And, and this one was focused on a lot of AI issues. And um, some, of, some of the things that are uh, illustrative of this to me are 94% of organizations say the customers would not buy from them if they don't protect data properly. 91% of organizations think they have to do more to build customer confidence in AI. Over half of the consumers have already lost trust in organizations over their AI practices, and there doesn't seem to be much progress on this front. I can go on and on and on, but I won't. The, and this is 8,000 organizations that were, uh, that were surveyed. Um, and yeah, I will find a link to that and send it around to everybody. Uh, thanks for that suggestion. Um, but the thing that's really important to me is that the interests of the regulators, of the investors, of the customers, they're all the same. 
And so that that really that's sort of like a perfect moment because everybody has incentives that are good. And I think I think that people are, you know, of course, there's still the pressure from last year to keep innovating and, and keep being, uh, in, you know, uh, on the forefront of that. But uh, but now I think the things that are sort of second level concerns are are all aligned. And that's really important. Um, Dylan, I was wondering if you could um, comment on any, when you've been looking at AI investments, is there anything that's really sort of put you off? Like, what do you, um, yeah, is there anything where you would just wouldn't go because it's just not clear yet um, what the regulations are going to be like? I don't I don't know if there's some uh, somewhere that we wouldn't go just because of the regulations. Uh, I, I think that we have steered away from certain investments, maybe more to do with uh, the ethical considerations of, you know, how certain companies are using, you know, the data, the model, uh, you know, or the application throughout those those three different aspects and the three different life cycles. Um, you know, so I, I think I, I think it's it's a little bit less about necessarily just the regulation i think the the lack of clarity you know maybe can you know or um uh, inflate that be because you know sometimes uh you know we can all acknowledge that uh, there are ethical gray areas right and there are there are fair debates out there around you know some things that maybe one person considers less ethical than another and when we have clear regulations to help pave that that road you know maybe that can help clear clear up the picture uh, and, and help us, um, you know, go, go one way or, or another. But but I think generally, you know, there are industry standards and industry norms around, you know, what is ethical and what is not ethical. Uh, and, and, and that's probably more of a driver of, you know, uh, us to you know, maybe stop moving forward with an investment uh, versus, versus just purely regulatory speculation. If I can just jump in here. Um, I think there's kind of a hundred different reasons why we wouldn't invest in any given company at any given time. Um, but an interesting part of being investing in really cutting edge technology is your ability to actually validate what's happening or not. So I think one of the really interesting areas around generative AI is validating generative AI and understanding exactly what results are coming out and being able to pull what pieces have gone into the model. Um, and that the layers of security, I've, we're talking about that with hidden layer of doing the, like knowing exactly what data is being pulled in or what's being produced and being able to identify that um, and validate that is a really, really interesting part of the um, technological development in this area. Um, and I think we'll probably all be able to answer that question better as the technology and validation of the technology <laughs> develops kind of hand in hand. Um, but I, I, I just want to say that like in, in this space, like our investment team and our like sort of investment ethos really truly believe that trust is a differentiator and a value additive element. Um, and it just really can't be, you know, understated, particularly in this area. I think Stuart just gave, you know, all those, um, all, all those points to where sentiment is out in the market right now, but not just sort of on the, the, the lowest end of what, where we wouldn't go, but actually really from the forefront, having it built in, we think it's so essential in this space. Um, and it's it, not to kind of like take a, a, a hard turn, but I think one of the elements that is really difficult as a young company is establishing your, um, you know, trust, trustworthiness in the market, basically. Um, and as a company that has a long operating history, you can show that you have over time always stood behind what you're, what you're doing, what your processes are, um, processes are, and practices. But as uh, like new entrants into the market, being able to actually show and validate what that is to the market is really difficult. And I think it brings in a lot of the questions that we're seeing from antitrust regulators right now of really big players, uh, you know, investing in other um, kind of early winners in this space. And it begs the question we sort of are asking ourselves of like what segments of the generative A market are really ripe for brand new small company innovations and which ones 
feel like they're already being dominated by large players. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, like movement we've seen in the antitrust space has been asking that as well recently. Yeah, uh, just to add one more uh, piece on top of what you just mentioned, Laura, I think uh, we wholeheartedly agree with uh, trust being a differentiator. Uh, and I would just say it's actually part of our pitch, uh, you know, when we're talking to you know, prospective portfolio companies like IBM has been around for well over 110 years. Uh, and the reason that we've been around, we recognize is because we're we're trusted by so many enterprises. Um, you know, it's no secret. There are certain, you know, the, when, when you look at some IBM products, there are some products out there that are maybe a little bit, you know, more innovative. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I think, you know, the, the largest companies in the world can come to IBM and, and feel that, um, you know, uh, that they aren't taking a risk with the, the technology that they're buying. And, and when we go and talk to our portfolio companies, uh, you know, we, we take that really seriously. Uh, and it's a two-way street. We want to make sure we're investing in companies that uh, uphold that brand, uh, right? Uh, and then in return, uh, you know, uh, we, we hope that we can help build that trust with them over time. And, just, and I would add, just from the, uh, Oh yeah, go first. And then I'll go. Uh, just, just, just briefly, I would say from a small company perspective that doesn't have that long term, we've only been around for two years. So I give advice to other companies in the AI space because uh, often, um, you know, you're already introducing that level of, you know, not necessarily distrust, but the inexplicability of what, uh, of what potentially like a neural network or another black box AI product is doing, where you may not even be able to, even if you wanted to go back and understand exactly how, something took place, but, but there, there are a lot of ways that you can uh, try and build that trust with your consumers and the buyers. Like for example, at Hidden Layer, uh, we've committed to not do any business in any country that falls below the median in the uh, World Freedom Index. Um, you know, there, there are things that you can do to, to help show others that, you know, that, that the ethical component here is, is absolutely something that you're going to uphold. And, and I think it's necessary when you talk about a, such a technology that isn't as understand or isn't as well understood as others. So I think that there are definitely steps you can take, but, uh, but, in, you know, partnering with organizations that have that, uh, that those longstanding sort of records of trust is incredibly important as well. But, um, but I, but I urge other organizations like ours that are in that, uh, um, scenario to try and find creative ways to to show your intentions. And, and I think it goes a long way with the customers. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, on the investor side, when we're speaking to, I think that call with founders is really a critical moment on the legal side, even if it's just getting to know them and understanding how they thought about the development of their product. Um, you know, I was on a strategic investment call, not in the AI space, but in another emerging space in blockchain. And the, the law firm on the other side was bringing up issues with their own client's product and questions. And we were sort of puzzled at that point saying like, are you presenting to us or are you asking us for the answers? Right. So, um, you know, the next meeting in that, uh, investment, um, you know, the founder came onto the phone, sort of told the lawyers to stop talking and presented a deck and, you know, explain the various components of the, of the, of the technology, how it was developed how they thought about, and in, in the AI case, you know, you can think about sort of how you have inputs, what are the outputs, as Laura, Lara mentioned earlier, um, you know, how did you develop them? Did you think about bias in that context? Like, these are all really important things to think about so that you avoid or mitigate some of the things that the regulators are talking about. A lot of people, and even in the Q&A, are talking about IP and copyright risk with respect to training data, but regulators are being pretty loud in the U.S. at least around you know, some of these things can just be deceptive acts or practices inherently, right? If you're if you're building things that are just simply, um, whether they're biased or have other legal implications, and you know, we talked about algorithmic destruction, algorithm destruction in the in the IP cases being maybe a little bit less likely, but regulators will go after models and and try to sort of ensure that they are destructed if they are are non-compliant with with sort of you know legal principles that exist in various jurisdictions. And so, so I think understanding that as an investor, I think is critical, but also on the company side, really presenting it in the right way with, with, you know, I've thought about these issues. Here's kind of my roadmap to sort of compliance, I think are, are really great ways to get lawyers to stop talking and to stop asking questions and um, make the diligence process go much smoother. And so, so we really think about that on both sides of our practice um, every day to make sure that those those transactions become more efficient in the end because we're sort of previewing those things early and, and often uh, to both sides. I was going to ask just about the, the copyright issues. Um, you know, like 
the the New York Times um, lawsuit. What do you think could be the possible outcome there? And and you know how how should companies that are producing these generative AI models um, using copyrighted material, like what what should they be looking out for from this from the outcome of this of this lawsuit? Right. So on the first question, I actually neither Stuart or I can answer because we represent both those parties in separate uh, endeavors. But um, maybe I'll try to answer your question a little bit differently because I think I touched on it earlier. Um, you know, we actually had a great Q and A question about IP in the in the in the chat. Um, thinking about it from the flip side, which is like, how do we have to think about risk if I'm using those tools, right? And um, I think I can speak to that, and then I'll go back to your question a little bit. But um, you know, a lot of the the models are actually providing limited indemnification now um, with respect to IP risk for people who are using their tools. Um, you got to read those a little bit closely and think about what how you're using it because there are exclusions and lawyers write exclusions pretty broadly and you know use them to their advantage when when they need to. Um, but there are limited indemnity, and I think you know GitHub has sort of the code screener, which allows you to sort of screen some of the code that you're developing, which is a great tool as well. Um, so there are some mitigation things happening um, in the industry. Um, as for your other question, I think I'll go back to my answer of um, we don't know yet. Um, we certainly have seen um, with respect to outputs, we've seen judges say those need to be substantially similar to the inputs from a copyright perspective. And then I'll answer it to say the law is actually you know, pretty well delineated on copyright infringement cases. Um, as well as right of publicity, as you think about the deep fake question from earlier. Um, I think that if you are putting something into your model and something very similar is coming out of your model, you have a problem on your hands. Um, but the more transformative the content and the outputs are, whether they are subject to copyright or right of publicity claims, you're going to have defenses, right? And so, um, you know, certainly there are cases such as the Google Books case where um, you know, to the extent that the output is for a different purpose or a transformative purpose under the law, you know, there are examples of fair use that are going to come into play. And fair use has four factors. I'm not going to get into all the analysis of fair use on this webinar, but um, certainly those cases are going to get litigated. And I think the, the direct copying of the input is where, you know, the, those particular claims are going to get litigated and go to trial. Um, and we just don't have answers yet on that. Um, but I've certainly told investors not to stop investing in the in the in the in the sort of process here. Um, and we're just trying to gather as much information at, at early stages on both sides to understand the risk and the mitigation strategy. And one question I'll just turn back to to our, to our investors and operators is, you know, I know earlier you said you wouldn't necessarily not invest in a in a company because of regulatory or or, or other legal risk, but I assume you may think about that from how much money they actually might need to get through the process, right? I mean, some companies may really need a lot more money earlier uh, than others, and it's sort of an interesting sort of question um, on that front. So, Kim, hopefully I answered your question to some extent. Thank you. Um, Dylan, would you like to just comment on that, what um, BJ just mentioned? Yeah, uh, happy to. I uh, I think that... Uh, it this goes back to, to what Laura was mentioning uh, around stage first, right? So I think, you know, assessing that risk, um, you know, for a seed stage company is going to be a lot different than assessing that risk um, it, within the companies that are in the headlines today, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, we all know kind of the the giants in the space. Um, you know, I, I think personally, uh, when it comes to the, the investments that we make, we're, we're focused on enterprise applications and uh, enterprise infrastructure software. So I, I think that, you know, maybe our portfolio is a little bit less at risk. Generally, um, the, uh, the, the the marketing around the applications that, that we invest in, you know, are, uh, you know, they won't be using your data to, uh, you know, like train their models. They they won't be, you know, like your data is safe. I, I think a lot of enterprises are going to be uncomfortable, you know, uh, kind of letting their data get outside of, uh, you know, uh, or, or be used in any use cases that aren't, you know, uh, just just for them. So I, I think maybe the, the question is really more focused on like the model providers or, you know, some 
uh, some applications that are a little bit more around kind of those early content generation use cases, but uh, but we're just a little bit less focused there. So I, I could see that risk popping up though, if we had more of a focus there. Hey, I don't know if you want to allow for um, a little sort of overview on, on all of this, uh, but very quickly, this is not something that's brand new to us. Um, there are lots of unknowns in lots of new technologies that we've seen for a long time before. Since the 70s, IBM has been asking uh, smaller companies that it works with to come up with certifications of originality to make sure that copyright looks pretty good, you know, good enough for, for their purposes. In the patent space, little companies don't have time or money to spend on it, but you want to make sure that they have thought about it a little bit and can speak to what they would do if they did get this funding in open source. There are all kinds of uncertainties that we've been de dealing with. So this is just an acceleration of all of those things because it's so central. Um, well, we are um, running out of time. So I wanted to um, thank the panelists for um, yeah, joining us today on this, on this webinar. Thank you for a very insightful um, comments on the regulatory landscape for generative AI. I'm just gonna finish up here. So um, the we do have a another GCB um, webinar coming up on um, February the 14th. So it's, it's Valentine's Day, but um, why not listen in to a webinar, a romantic webinar about venture building, how to avoid the common mistakes. We also have some upcoming events. Um, our GCBI Summit um, is coming up in Monterey, California in March. Um, we also have some upcoming institute courses. And um, if you have any questions about today's um, webinar, please contact me, here's my, here's my contact details. Thank you for, for joining us today. And um, yeah, thanks again to the panelists.